chapter two, philosophy in film, unit five, comedy. The readings we will be discussing today, or I will, are first of all, the section from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which is always a great resource on philosophy of humor by John Morial. Second, um, the article, the Ethics of Humor, Can Your Sense of Humor Be Wrong? by Aaron Smuts. And last, um, the article, Taking Humor Ethics Seriously But Not Too Seriously by the South African philosopher David Benatar. Um, okay, let's begin. The Morial article is a rundown, first of all, of what famous philosophers have said what about uh, humor or comedy. And turns out, not much. Um, and what they have said throughout history was initially very negative. So, for example, Plato and the Stoics uh, pointed out that laughter overrides rational self-control, and Plato is very negative about uh, laughter in the Republic. If you uh, read it, you will know that. He thinks that it's, uh, it's a bad influence. Aristotle, who has, as usual with Aristotle, kind of a nuanced view, and he contributes to several of the theories um, because, you know, Aristotle doesn't tend to say one simple thing about anything. Uh, but certainly one of the things he says was that uh, laughter expresses scorn. <clears throat> the Bible, uh, Second Kings, is that right? Not Two Kings. Uh, Second Kings 2.23 tells a delightful story of when the prophet Elisha is laughed at for his baldness by a bunch of kids and he curses them and two she-bears come out of the woods and maul 42 of the kids. So that seems to suggest that uh, laughter is justly punished. The laughter of children, what a wonderful thing. It is punished by death by bear. Um, then we have Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes, uh, author, of course, of The Leviathan, one of the all-time classics of philosophy. Uh, quote from The Leviathan, those grimaces called laughter. That doesn't make Hobbes sound like a fun-loving guy. Uh, and he also says that laughter expresses scorn. And then we have Descartes, a uh, contemporary of Hobbes, actually slightly younger than Hobbes, uh, who said that derision was joy plus hatred and that laughter was caused by wonder at a defect so if i see a giant wart on the side of your nose it will cause me to titter at you so none of these make uh, humor or laughter in general seem like a good thing and in fact they gave birth these kind of views gave birth to the first of the theories of what humor is that morial discusses which he calls the superiority theory. Yeah, so Morial's article is more about uh, explaining humor or, or what is comedy, or what, what is it for something to be funny. Whereas the other two articles are, as they, their titles suggest, about the ethics of humor. Uh, when should you find something funny or when should you not find something funny or uh, can racist or sexist or generally objectionable jokes still be funny. Um, so that's the discussion in those second two articles, whereas this one, although it, it touches on that as well, uh, is mainly about um, explaining the nature of comedy, what makes something funny, which of course is a very unfunny exercise and uh, often boring. <laughs> but uh, we're looking at the theories and I want you, in the course of watching the movies of this unit, the, the most of which I think are funny, uh, all of which I think are funny, and I hope some of which you will find funny, um, I want you to bear in mind uh, what kind, which of these theories seems best suited to explain the particular kind of funny of each movie. And it's a different kind of funny in each movie. Uh, of course, in the silent comedies, it's there's a lot of, you know, physical comedy. Uh, and the, and in uh, Monsieur Hulot, the great Jacques Tati film, and also actually in uh, Kung Fu Hustle, the most recent of the movies on the list, there, there's a lot of physical comedy involved. 
whereas with uh, uh, some of the others, it's wit. So, for example, although there is also physical comedy in um, the screwball comedies of the 30s uh, and leading up to um, Some Like It Hot, uh, there's physical comedy there too, uh, but there's also a lot of witty wordplay. Um, you know, what kind of, what, what is the best explanation of what makes that funny? All right, so the first theory is the superiority theory. And the basic idea there is that our laughter expresses feelings of superiority over either some other being or person uh, or ourselves at a former time. So sort of as ourselves are in the past are sort of a stranger to us now, um, we can count them as somebody else. Actually, that's the issue of the next unit, personal identity, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Okay, so that's basic idea, and it's attributed to uh, a lot of those philosophers we just mentioned, including Hobbes. Uh, a critic of Hobbes, uh, Francis Hutcheson, um, presented some uh, early criticisms of this theory. So first of all, he points out that uh, a sense of superiority is not necessary for laughter. Uh, remember, I've already talked about the difference between necessary and sufficient, and I discuss this in, when I teach logic. Um, but something is necessary for something else if you can't have the second thing without the first. Obviously, that's what necessary means. Um, and something is sufficient for something else if the first thing guarantees the second. In other words, if you have the first one, you automatically have the second. So presumably a superiority theory says that feelings of superiority are both necessary and sufficient to laughter. You can't have laughter without a sense of superiority, so it's necessary. And uh, if you have a sense of superiority, that will automatically lead to laughter, so it's sufficient. Well, Hutchison pointed out it's not necessary because you can laugh at odd figures of speech. Um, the, uh, the, the, Muriel gives the example from the great comic writer P.G. Woodhouse, who's responsible for Jeeves and Worcester, which are one of the great comic creations in all literature. Uh, he says, if it's feasible, let's fees it, you know, which is just kind of a pun. Um, I'm not even sure if it's a pun, but it's, it's, it's a P.G. Woodhouse type play on words. Uh, if you laugh at that, and many people have, then you, uh, you are laughing without a sense of superiority. There's no obvious superiority. There's no obvious person to feel superior to, and yet it's funny. So that shows that superiority, a sense of superiority is not necessary. Something else that uh, does that, and Hutchison brought this up, is that if you see uh, an animal doing something particularly clever, like, you know, all those videos on the internet of um, raccoons stealing food in their little hands uh, from cats and running off with them, uh, if that makes you laugh, you're not laughing because you feel superior to something else, in this case, the raccoon. You're laughing at the cleverness of the, uh, the creature involved. So, um, that shows that sense of superiority is also not necessary. Also, a sense of superiority is not sufficient. You can feel superior over the over dumb animals like the poor cats that are getting the food stolen from them, uh, without that leaving leading to laughter. And uh, you can feel better off than a beggar on the street, and in a sense feel superior in that in that respect, but not feel necessarily happy about it or feel the feel caused to laugh about it. So it is neither superior, uh, sorry, neither sufficient nor necessary. A sense of superiority is not necessary or sufficient for laughter. Uh, uh, so those, those examples were from Hutchinson and Muriel adds a few more. He says, if you laugh at the skills of a uh, silent comic like um, uh, Buster Keaton or Charlie Chaplin or Harold Lloyd in the three examples that are on in the movies that you can watch this this unit. Uh, you're not laughing at a sense of superiority. I mean, if anything, you're thinking, my God, how does that guy do that? Uh, so it's not necessary, superiority is not necessary. Uh, he says, you can laugh at yourself right now. You know, you're looking, he says, I'm looking for my eyeglasses and then there they are on my forehead. And you laugh at yourself right now. Um, are you, you, it is impossible for you to feel superior to you 
because you are you, so you can't be superior to you. Uh, so clearly this is another example of um, laughter without a sense of superiority, so it's not necessary. And then there's the example from apparently Lambert Deckers uh, did these uh, experiments with weights where people were asked to lift up boxes that, and they were getting heavier and heavier uh, as the boxes got larger I think uh, and then you know you get to a box that's really large and you, you brace yourself to lift it really heavy and it turns out to be incredibly la light and the people always laugh um, what's how do you explain that with the superiority theory it just doesn't seem related in any way so superiority theory First of all, it presents laughter in a very negative light as just scorn. It's, it's more like a theory of sneering, I would have thought, than, than humor. Uh, but second, it just doesn't seem to work. There, you can think of many examples where you laugh without feeling superior, so it's not necessary, and uh, you feel superior without laughing, so it's not su sufficient. So we move on to the relief theory. Uh, first suggested by Lord Shaftesbury in 1709, but most famously argued for by Sigmund Freud, the um, you know the great psychoanalysis inventor of psychoanalysis. This is uh, described as a hydraulic ex uh, explanation. In other words, it works on the model of fluids in tubes pushing things around. Um, Freud, a lot of Freud's uh, explanations do this, like his explanations of the compulsion to wash your hands uh, is like uh, repressed sexual thoughts ne uh, emerging as, as steam from a relief valve. So just as a, if you have a water heater or a, a, a steam under pressure inside a vessel, this vessel better have a safety valve so that if pressure works out and one it's but if the pressure is supposed to leave by a leave by a pipe but the pipe gets blocked then the pressure will build up in the vessel and unless there's a safety valve the vessel will explode you know embedding shrapnel in anybody nearby so you have a built-in safety valve that uh, will allow the pressure to be released if its usual means of leaving the vessel is blocked. And that pressure valve is like laughter, according to this theory. So something is building up in you, uh, and it's supposed to be relieved, uh, released some other way, but that's not happening for some reason, so the safety valve is to laugh. Uh, so laughter is to the nervous system what pressure relief valve is to a steam boiler. Um, Herbert Spencer suggested that uh, emotions take the physical form of nervous energy and laughter is the nervous energy of emotions that are found inappropriate. Um, and an example to illustrate this is the Aunt Maud poem. Um, I like that poem uh, where the idea is you're being set up to feel sorry for Aunt Maud. Yes, the poem is called Waste by Harry Graham and it dates from 2009. This is on page 10. I had written to Aunt Maud, who was on a trip abroad, when I heard she died of cramp, just too late to save the stamp. So, you know, by the third line, you say you're sort of shocked. It raises shock and oh my God, Poor Aunt Maud has died, and then the uh, last line reveals the writer to not care about Aunt Maud, to care more about you know saving a few pennies. On, well, it's more than that now, but a few pennies on a stamp. So, uh, uh, and so, if you laugh at that, it looks like the laughter is caused as a sort of shock, a shock at um, oh my God. Is he really so callous? And there's a lot of humor like that, where you're, um, you laugh in sort of shock at the, the callousness or, or at uh, shock humor, basically. The comic Anthony Jezelnik, uh, if you don't know him, I, I think he has specials on Netflix, or you can just look him up on YouTube. But his humor is like that a lot. Uh, I meant to write down an example, but I can't remember one. But um, um, 
I'm trying to think if this would be the right one. And uh, another great, uh, Jozelnik is one of the, is a comic who tells jokes. Not all comics do that, of course. Some comics just tell stories uh, and, you know, it's sort of stream of consciousness. But there are joke tellers and some of the great ones of those are like Stephen Wright, a very deadpan guy with sort of frizzy Larry Fine hair. Uh, look him up. He's he's brilliant. Um, and one I'm particularly fond of is a guy called Emo Phillips, who uh, got big in the 80s and then kind of disappeared. But he's he's back again, who also has a very strange stage persona. He has this sort of Prince Valiant haircut and he speaks in a very squeaky voice like this and sort of does strange movements. So he presents himself as this like weirdo you'd want to avoid on the bus. Uh, but what was one joke he he said? Um, he said, I was jogging in the park when I had an asthma attack or asthmatic attack. And he says, I know, I know what you're thinking. I should have heard them coming. You know, the idea being that he was attacked by asthmatics and, you know, he should have heard them wheezing. Um, the, the, the joke works by sort of subverting your expectations. But now there's also the next theory of expectation uh, of humor might do a better job of explaining that. But anyway, uh, so Freud's theory says that it is uh, essentially relief. Laughter is relief of suppressed emotions or emotions that would otherwise find a different expression. Now, Freud, uh, Freud wrote, wrote a lot on humor. Um, and as is true of a lot of what Freud wrote, it's kind of largely rejected these days. But he did divide humor into three categories. Der Witz, him, he being German, or at least writing in German, uh, which includes joking or repartee. And he says there, the energy released is what would have, is the energy that would have been used to repress emotions that instead uh, are allowed to go free. Uh, say, and the emotions, Freud, of course, famously, everything, just about everything is to do with sex or death, uh, usually sex. And so the emotions that are usually repressed are sexual desire or hostility. And basically, in a joke, you're being allowed or that you're being allowed to release them. So the laughter is you don't need the energy anymore that supposedly normally makes you tamp these down so the energy can be released and laughter is the form it gets released in. The second category of humor is called the comic. Uh, the energy released would have been devoted to thinking. Now this one is really weird. Um, he has a, his example is a clumsy clown. The antics of a clumsy clown cause you to laugh because his he does things more simply or crudely than they should have been done. So you are prepared to expend mental energy thinking about a complicated activity. But then this crude, simple version of that activity happens. So you've got this extra energy that you are sort of banking to spend on complex thinking. And you've got this extra energy going around because it turned out you didn't need much energy because it was simple. Uh, and you've got to get rid of that energy and that comes out as laughter. Convinced? Uh, no, I mean, as um, as Muriel says, this this idea of mimetic representation, theory of mimetic representation, that is that there's energy involved in thinking about things and more energy is required, the more complicated the things are, is just weird. Like as he says, thinking about swimming the English Channel takes far more energy than thinking about licking a stamp on this theory and that's just strange. So we're not buying that one. Uh, the third category of humor is just called humor. And there the release of energy was, a was about to be used on other emotion. And here this sounds like the Aunt Maud example again, or another example that Moriel brings up is Mark Twain's story, supposedly about his brother. His brother's working on the railroad and uh, dynamite is set off too soon while he's too near and he gets flung through the air far away and it takes him a while to come back having been thrown through the air by dynamite and he has docked half a day's pay for not being on the job uh, and of course this is particularly unfair uh, but it's funny so you're 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 prepared to deal with and my brother was killed or something like that I think 
um, I think Mark Twain's brother actually was killed by an exploding steam boiler. So it's like all of the things in this uh, chapter coming together. On, uh, I know Mark Twain describes horrific explosions on uh, uh, steam-powered vessels uh, on the Mississippi, where you know people are just steamed alive. You know the worst way to die. You're, you're scalded to death, so all the flesh is cooked off your bones. It's horrific and massive explosions when these things went up on. Uh, on river boats on the Mississippi. I think that's how his brother died. But maybe he had more than one. And maybe it was it, this never happened to his brother. He just told it as if it was. But the theory is that uh, there was, you were getting ready to use emotions to feel sorry for his brother. Oh my God, he was killed or wounded or something like that. And then this is subverted by the joke so that you don't have to feel sorry for him because he's not dead. Uh, and you laugh, you know, like in Aunt Maud. Um, but this theory, the relief theory, just seems weird. Uh, hu there is humor without emotions, like the if it's feasible, let's feize it, or the, uh, the shortest poem in the English language, which was notes on the uh, antiquity what is it? Lines on the antiquity of microbes, and it's just Adam had them. Uh, it's, there's a kind of contrast between the complexity of the title and the simplicity of the poem itself and the brevity. Uh, but there's no clear emotion involved with that. And uh, Freud also said, so Freud's theory of Der Witz is that it's unconscious, that this whole process is unconscious. But clearly, wit and repartee is very much conscious in professional comics, you know, comic writers or stand-ups. Uh, it's a whole process in coming up with this humor, so that just doesn't seem right. So that theory seems bogus, but, you know, maybe it works for um, particular instances of humor, and you might want to argue that one of the first two theories, the superiority or the relief, works better than the third theory, which is the most popular theory nowadays, the incongruity theory. Maybe the other two work better for certain instances of humor. And, you know, maybe we need, maybe not everything can be explained with the incongruity theory. Okay, so the incongruity theory is that the cause of laughter is something incongruous, something that strikes us as out of place. There's a there's an, a mismatch incongruity between things. Now, what the things are that there's a mismatch between uh, depends on the particular incongruity theory, and different writers have different theories. Um, but, but basically, laughter is is or is caused by a perception of incongruity. Aristotle, who I said, you know can be drawn on for just about every theory because he says so many things about so many things. In the rhetoric, gives uh, he's giving advice to speakers, that's what the rhetoric is, and he talks about telling a joke, and, and one of the jokes is, as he walked beneath his feet, or what is it, he felt beneath his feet chillblains. Now, chillblains are a particular... Uh, condition that you get when your feet get too cold. It's sort of like a baby version of frostbite. Um, and I know this because uh, I was always told to wear thick socks in the winter so I wouldn't get them. And uh, it was, I was told that my grandpa, born in 1896, uh, used to get them terribly and was, had to stay away from school from in, for entire terms when he was a little kid because uh, of... Um, the chillblains. So I don't know if that was true, but that's what chillblains are. But basically, the joke there is that you're expecting him to feel beneath his feet some kind of surface, but instead he's feeling what's actually on the bottom of his feet. Um, so it's a joke. But there's so there's an incongruity. Your expectation is subverted, and that's the key to incongruity theories. You build up an expectation, and then it's subverted, and that's the key to uh, so many jokes. And and you know most stand-up involves that kind of thing. Um, that's involved in the Emo Phillips uh, humor, for example. Um, another great line from Emo Phillips is, you know, 
he looks like a total weirdo, so you expect him to be a virgin, but he says, I'm a great lover, I bet. And so there's sort of this long pause, and then he says, I bet, revealing that, you know, it's all in his mind, that he has never had sex at all. Um, but just that one line involves raising the expectation because you're expecting an explanation or evidence for his his sexual prowess that then he reveals that he's never had sex. Um, Cicero, James Beattie in 1779, Kant in 1790 all gave theories of this. Uh, Kant, not noted for his humor, tells three jokes on page 17. The Indian who is amazed at frothy beer, the rich heir who uh, the more he pays mourners, uh, the happier they seem, and the merchant whose wig goes white from grief. That reminds me of an Oscar Wilde line uh, from The Importance of Being Earnest, where um, someone is reporting on one of her society friends who is an older woman whose husband has just died. And she says, I hear, I hear her hair has gone quite gold from grief, implying that, you know, A, she's pretty happy, and maybe B, she's dying her hair so she can go out on the dating scene again. Um, but Kant's theory, although, you know, this uh, incongruity theory is generally considered the best theory, his his version of it has some weird features like he describes laughter as the physical jostling of your intestines and that, that just sounds gross that doesn't uh, i mean we talk about gut busting laughter but you know this is taking it a little seriously and he mentions the idea that play might be involved with um laughter which uh Moriel makes hay of later as we shall see uh, another theorist who presents an incongruity theory is Schopenhauer. Um, Schopenhauer is... Actually, I bet ben uh, Schopenhauer is a favorite theorist of, of Benatar. Uh, Benatar, the author of the third article, he is very well known for writing a book called Better Never to Have Been. In other words, we would have been better off if we hadn't been born. And Schopenhauer is famous for arguing the same thing, that basically existence is terrible. Uh, he's Woody Allen's favorite um, philosopher, unsurprisingly. Um, Woody Allen uh, in, in Annie Hall, at the beginning of Annie Hall, tells a famous joke that sort of illustrates this, uh, that, that um, two old Jewish ladies are complaining about the food at a restaurant. And one says... The food here is terrible, and the other one agrees and said, and such small portions. You know, the joke being, why would you want big portions if it's terrible food? Uh, but what Woody Allen goes on to say, and, and that's my attitude towards life. You know, it's shitty, and it's over way too soon. Well, Schopenhauer, as far as I know, lived to a ripe old age. However, his theory is that... Uh, Laughter involves absurdity, which is lack of fit. So the incongruity in his case is between our sense perception of things, the way we see the world to be, and our abstract rational knowledge of things. Um, and he tells a couple of jokes. They're real quips, does these philosophers. There's the prison card joke. This is on page 19. Let's look at... Uh, what does, what's the version of that? That's where um, he says, uh, actually, no, it's on page 20, isn't it? Prison cards who allowed a convict to pay, play cards with them, but when they caught him cheating, they kicked him out, obviously releasing him from prison, which they shouldn't do. But, you know, the idea being you always kick out people who are cheating. It's just they forgot that they were guards and he was they were supposed to be guarding him. And then the other one is the Austrian. Every, uh, every country has a different version of the stupid people that are the butt of jokes for being stupid. Um, so, for example, uh, in England, it used to be the Irish. Uh, not anymore, I would hope. But certainly, when I was a kid, you know, hackneyed, terrible old comedians would tell jokes 
about the Irish, implying that they're stupid. Uh, in Canada, it is Newfies, and you will see a reference to that, uh, I believe, in either Smuts or Benatar. Uh, Newfies are people from Newfoundland, and apparently they're the, stu they're the butt of Canadians' humor. So a Newfie joke uh, will be, this person is so stupid because blah, blah, blah. Um, and apparently, uh, where Schopenhauer was, it was Austrians. Um, given who they've elected, maybe there was something in that. Um, so, the, but he, he, his Austrian joke was that uh, somebody said, uh, I'm going for a walk, I want to walk alone. And then the Austrian said, I want to walk alone too, let's walk alone together. Which remind uh, another version of this is the um, Yogi Berra joke or the the Yogi Berra line, which is uh, nobody goes there anymore. It's too crowded. Um, now the Schopenhauer theory, uh, the advantages of his version of the theory are that it it explains the offensiveness of being laughed at. So this is Schopenhauer arguing, because it asserts that there is a great incongruity between our conception and the objective reality. So in other words, the incongruity has been between the way I see the world and the way it is, and this is being pointed out by the joke teller, so I am the butt of humor. But that makes it offensive to me, because the implication is there's this big gap between the way I see the world. In other words, I'm seeing the world wrong, I'm getting everything wrong. So that's why people don't like being laughed at. It also explains another feature of humor, the pleasure of humor. Um, and according to Schopenhauer, the pleasure in humor is that our perceptions are disagreeing with our rational understanding and revealing our rational understanding to be wrong. And as our rational understanding is like this harsh task mistress, the theory that is supposed to be true, uh, Kierkegaard, it's like, Seeing our, our rational understanding subverted or undercut is like seeing a troublesome governess convicted of insufficiency. I'm not sure that's particularly hilarious, but that's his explanation. Another theorist, uh, another incongruity theorist is uh, Kierkegaard, famous, uh, the Danish philosopher who invented the leap of faith and basically invented existentialism. Um, he has this theory that there are three spheres of existence. Now, you don't really need to understand this um, to get his theory, but the three spheres are the aesthetic sphere, the ethical sphere, and the religious sphere. And he says irony is the borderline between the aesthetic and the ethical, and humor is the borderline between the ethical and the religious. And again, what humor is explained by a disparity between what is experienced and what is expected. Now, his joke is actually uh, better than most, or at least in my opinion. Uh, it's the joke about the baker. Uh, where is it? Yes, he cites the story, this is on page 22. He cites the story of the baker who said to the begging woman, No, mother, I cannot give you anything. There was another here recently whom I had to send away without giving anything to. We cannot give to everybody. Actually, what he means is we cannot give to everybody. Um, but I guess that's funny. All right. He also uh, pointed out something that later writers make great hay of, of the contrast between the tragic and the comic and actual the, the similarities between the tragic and the comic. Uh, for Kierkegaard, the tragic is a suffering contradiction, whereas the comic is a painless contradiction. But... The similarity is they're both based on contradiction. And William Hazlitt, who actually predates um, Kierkegaard, they're both 19th century, but Hazlitt is in 1819. Um, he's a famous essay essayist. He writes uh, great essays on all kinds of topics. Um, he uh, pointed out the, that the human life is made up of the tragic and the comic. comic. Uh, this is... To explain the nature of laughter and tears is to account for the condition of human life, for it is in a manner compounded of the two. It is a tragedy or a comedy, sad or merry, as it happens. This reminds me of the great Mel Brooks, 
who of course is responsible for Blazing Saddles, one of the great comedies on your that you have a chance to watch and probably have already seen. Uh, Mel Brooks had a great line, which is about tragedy and comedy. He said, uh, tragedy is when I cut my finger. Comedy is when you fall into an open sewer and die. Now, that line is also, uh, you could say that one uh, lend, lends itself to the relief theory because it's shocking. Uh, and, but the interesting contrast, so the contrast is that the person saying this is revealed to be incredibly self-centered and also his humor is other people's suffering. Um, but as we shall see, uh, there's, there's something, something to be said in that view of tragedy and comedy. Contemporary psychologists have their own versions of the incongruity theory. So, this is on page 23, Thomas Schultz and Jerry Sewells, uh, they say that what is different about their version from the previous versions is in the previous version, uh, it is the incongruity itself that causes the humor. Whereas what uh, Schultz and Sewells and other contemporary psychologists say is, no, it is not the incongruity that causes the humor. It is the resolution of incongruity. Uh, so they say that jokes are like solving puzzles. Uh, and in fact, they, they criticize the previous incongruity theorists because they say, unless the incongruity is resolved, if it's unresolved, then you just have nonsense. You have something confusing. Confusion should be your reaction, not laughter. Um, the illustration that Moriel gives is the Mae West line. Uh, marriage is a wonderful institution, but I'm not ready for an institution yet. So the, the idea being the pl a pl pun on the word institution. But you get the pun. You see, ah, I see what you did there. And that's what making uh, what laughter is. Laughter is the manifestation of, oh, I get it. Um, I'm not sure I, 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 that appeals to me as much as the earlier version, but see what you think. Uh, now, the reason why they, prefer, they want to offer a new one is because they say that a perception of incongruity is not sufficient for humor. So merely spotting an incongruity is not enough to explain humor. So that's why they say it has to be something else, and they suggest resolving an incongruity illustration that um, perception of incongruity is not sufficient is you can perceive incongruity and it can produce other reactions in you like the macabre, the horrible, the bizarre, the fantastic, the pitiful, seeing incongruity between uh, like what um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, um, I remember this is a, an odd story, but it springs to mind. When I was a, in my first year of secondary school, I had someone who was my best buddy, but he was also, there was this other guy who competed to be his best buddy. Dave was the buddy's name and um, Alistair was the other guy. So I hated Alistair because he was like the rival, my rival for the affections of Dave and he hated me. Uh, now at the time we were little nerds uh, interested in computer programming. I, me and Dave were pretty good at it, but Alistair couldn't do it. But I remember one time Alistair had seen an arcade game and he brought to Dave while I was watching what he thought would be like a good program that might do what the arcade game did. And I saw it and I saw that it was uh, just a few lines and it wouldn't do and it was like so far off the mark that I, you'd think I would laugh at him because I dislike this guy, but I felt sorry for him because it betrayed such a, a failure to understand the rudiments of programming. Uh, so that was sort of an incongruity between uh, here's, you know, here's the program for an arcade game and should look and it's like three lines. Um, there's an incongruity there and the reaction is kind of pity. And that's certainly true. There are plenty other plenty of other reactions. Um, other than humor to incongruity. So there does seem a problem. We need to explain what's the extra thing. If it's incongruity, what, what is the extra that makes it humor rather than these other things? Michael Clark apparently offers three conditions. 
You, first, you've got to perceive the object as incongruous. Then you've got to enjoy perceiving the object. Clearly, I didn't enjoy perceiving, uh, you know, this failure of Alistair's. Uh, and you've got to enjoy the perceived incongruity for itself. I'm not sure that explains anything. That's kind of begging the question because you're enjoying it because it's funny. Uh, it doesn't seem like that explains why it's funny. The enjoyment is the funny, I would have said. All right, another problem with the incongruity theory, or at least the early versions of the incongruity theory, is that uh, incongruity itself is irrational. So it would be irrational, as Kant said, and actually Sat Santayana, George Santayana, made this objection. He said, man being a rational animal, this is on page 26, man being a rational animal can like absurdity no better than he can like hunger or cold, because all of them are irrational. There's no reason to them. And being rational, a rational creature, there's got to be a reason to it. So goes the criticism. Now... Uh, to respond to this criticism, Moriel suggests, okay, well, maybe humor is irrational, but uh, it's irrational in the way that play is irrational. We don't expect play to be irrational. We don't expect play to have a point, to have reasons for it. Play is just play. You know, certainly if you look at young children playing, we ask, why are you doing that? And it's like, we're just playing. There's not really an explanation to it. So it can be irrational uh, without that being a problem, without that being objectionable. So if the objection to the incongruity theory of humor is that it makes humor seem irrational, well, if humor is like play, then that's not really an objection. That's okay. So this is the idea that Moriel explores. Uh, on, And he suggests that Aristotle and Aquinas... Uh, Aquinas is always influenced by Aristotle, so if Aristotle says it, it's not surprising that Aquinas says it. Um, suggests that there there is a virtue to... Uh, well, Aristotle, as you probably know, Aristotle says that virtue lies between the means between two extremes. And the example of... He says there's a virtue called eutropelia, which is ready... translates basically as ready-wittedness which is the virtue between buffoons, people who just are clown all the time, and, you know, humorless jerks or boors. So you can go too far and just be a clown or a buffoon, or you can be a humorless jerk. Uh, at, those are the two vices in the extremes. The virtue in the mean is to be ready-witted. Um, so that suggests... Again, uh, again, we turn to Aristotle for another idea, and he says that humor can be virtuous. Um, and Aquinas suggests that humor is rest for the soul, so it's a good thing. Um, and rest, of course, doesn't have to be rational. Uh, pursuing this play idea, uh, Moriel turns to anthropologists and ethnologists, um, and, and the anthropologist Max Eastman in 1936, noticed that chimps laugh during tickling. So here is something that the other animals do. So maybe it's something, you know, man is a rational animal, but he also has features that he shares with the other animals, and maybe humor is one of them. So it, the objection that humor is not rational, therefore humans wouldn't do it. You know, humor on the incongruity theory is not rational, therefore, you know, it can't be right because humans laugh. Well, if apes laugh too, then clearly it's okay to say humor is irrational. Um, Marek Spinker, 2001, said young monkeys move in exaggerated ways to learn skills. Um, that would be more example of the play. And Moriel suggests that uh, joking is play in the way that it breaks rules. And here he cites the great 20th century English philosopher Grice, and Grice had notoriously complex theories of meaning, and in fact he had a theory of uh, conversational communication, and he says it follows certain rules, uh, and the rules, and, and Moriel says each of these rules, if you break it, is a particular form of humor. So that lends support to the idea that humor is play, play in that it's rule breaking. It's 
just like play breaks rules in young animals like young animals they fight they're not supposed to fight but they play fight so it's an exaggerated way to appear to be breaking society's rules okay so the rules of conversation that Grice suggests first do not be false no fake news um, and he points out that well think of humorous exaggeration uh, hyperbole that's jokes do that a lot so that's breaking that rule second rule do not go beyond the evidence you know never infer something that is that is not supported by the evidence well fat funny fantasies are, are like that um, avoid obscurity uh, and Muriel suggests well you know if somebody asks you a question that to answer it would reveal that you did something wrong it's funny to answer it in a very roundabout way like maybe you know that's funny uh, because you're breaking this rule you're being obscure he suggests and that, uh, the fourth rule of Grice's is avoid ambiguity meaning two things but of course that's exactly what puns do like the um, May West pun about institution that t that it requires ambiguity and finally be brief and of course there's shaggy dog stories or long rants there are co comedians that do this where they they just ramble on and on and on um, and it's the very rambling on and on and on it, that is part of the humor um okay so he goes into more detail about uh drawing parallels between the behavior of primates and what could count as humor um, so this is kind of an evolutionary theory of humor. He gives a brief discussion of the ethics of humor. Uh, on page 32, he cites Michael Phillips, who argues that, uh, for example, Polish jokes or Noopy jokes or Austrian jokes or whatever are racist. Um, now, but here, Moriel says something that both smuts and uh, Benatar would also agree with that no you can tell a Polish joke that requires that you know this that there's a stereotype that Polish uh, people are stupid um, that's the American version of Newfies is Polish people for some reason it, it dates to a certain period of immigration uh, and you know the the joke is about the Polish astronaut who's going to the Sun and people ask you, won't you burn up if you're going to the sun? He says, don't worry, I'll go at night, you know. So the joke turns on him being stupid. Uh, you can joke about, you can laugh at that without actually endorsing the stereotype or believing that Polish people are in fact stupid. Um, so he says, the real harm of humor, humor can cause harm. That is not an example, he says. But humor can cause harm because if you are in fact perpetuating stereotypes i don't know how you can avoid perpetuating that stereotype maybe you can frame it in such a way that makes it clear that you're laughing at the stereotype and that's something that uh, benatar suggests um but also treating something as uh, a subject that you can be unserious about that you can play with that is actually deadly serious and he gives the example of the 1974 National Lampoon uh, magazine cover uh, that mocked the album cover uh, George Harrison did a concept concert for Bangladesh in the early 70s because they were having a famine in Bangladesh and they released the album and it had a picture of a starving child on it and the the National Lampoon released a magazine cover showing that that only the kid was made out of chocolate and had a bite taken out of him that's mocking starvation and that he says that's just wrong <laughs> clearly wrong um, finally he returns to the uh, idea well if if as Moriel suggests laughter can be looked at like play does that really answer the irrationality objection only he suggests well if you can show that that play actually fosters rationality is good for rationality even if it is not itself rational but play uh, makes the people who indulge in it more rational as a result 
um, then you can't bring up the irrationality objection. It's uh, it's not irrational itself, but it it is, is conducive to to rationality. Um, he suggests he gives a suggestion on page thirty four and thirty five that humor by suspending an emotional response actually enables you to deal more rationally with something. Like, for example, if you joke about death, and he gives the example of Thomas More, who gave a literal example of gallows humor because he was being executed, and he said, I won't need helping. He can get, he said, I can get down on my own accord. Uh, you know, presumably because he'll fall off because he'll be dead. Um, and Oscar Wilde, of course, on his deathbed, looks at the wallpaper and says, this wallpaper is terrible, one of us has to go, knowing that he's about to die. So both of them are making light of their own uh, death. And another example, I think, from Benatar is the old man who every morning he says when he wakes up, he stretches out, and if he doesn't feel wood, he knows he's okay. In other words, he knows he's not in a coffin. Uh, so in joking about something like that, you are able to stay rational where instead of being reduced to a quivering wreck you know you you you're avoiding fear or other negative or stress involving emotions because you can laugh about it so he suggests we do this with humor and therefore humor is valuable because it enables us to deal rationally with the world uh, finally, we return to comedy versus tragedy. He says, tragedy valorizes warrior virtues, like blind obedience and will willingness to die. Whereas comedy is a good antidote to that. Uh, like in the Irish joke, uh, you're a coward for a moment, you're dead for the rest of your life. Um, you know, obviously saying it's okay to be a coward. And uh, if you... There's a lot of humor like this, like Chaplin it acts like a coward in a lot of uh, his movies, runs away from danger. Um, actually, all the silent comics do. And uh, Woody Allen does a lot of that in Love and Death. If you watch that movie, he, uh, he runs away. Um, and there's a joke in uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail uh, where, well, that, that's, no, that's actually mocking someone for running away where the, uh, the uh, bard is singing this song of Brave Sir Robin Ran Away. Anyway, uh, humor can actually valorize uh, things that in tragedy would be sneered at, such as self-preservation and stuff like that, um, in a way that is healthy and is conducive to survival. And this can be a good thing. Uh, and also, comedy is anti-elitist. This is another theme that Benatar returns to. And uh, Muriel ends up with a comparison of philosophy and stand-up. I'm going to pass over that in silence, because too many philosophers think they're funny when they're not. Um, and we shouldn't encourage them. There are a few who are actually funny, like... Uh, but even those can be very full of themselves. Like Daniel Dennett is able to write quite funny stuff, but he's also a very, someone who is full of himself, <laughs> let's put it that way. All right, so that's Moriol, that's his theory. He, he uh, goes over theories of humor. Now let's look at the other two. Uh, and as we're nearly at an hour already, I'm sure I've lost you, so I'll try and make this uh, quicker. They both cover a lot of the same ground, uh, that is, Smuts and uh, Benatar. So, um, I won't need to duplicate it. All right, Smuts, the ethics of humor. First thing he, uh, so he's offering theories, and but his theories are not of what makes something funny, which is what um, Moriol was interested in. His theories are about um, are theories that offer an account of when uh, you, something you are ethically allowed to to find something funny, or when uh, a joke is morally permissible. Um, now. 
The theory he first addresses is the attitudinal endorsement theory of Ronald D'Souza. Now, Ronald D'Souza's position is that if you find a racist joke funny, you are a racist. This is like the, the theory uh, that Moriol disagreed with, where, which said that um, if you laugh at a Polish joke, you believe the stereotype. Okay, so D'Souza is arguing this. If you, uh, if you laugh at a racist joke, you are a racist. I'm torn on this one, by the way. Um, when I was a kid, growing up in a very white environment, my stepbrother told me this joke. And it's a racist joke, so be prepared. He said, why did so many black people die in World War I? And his answer was, and remember, this is a child, so there's a child finding this funny. When they said, get down, because people were shooting at you, the black people said, yeah, get down. So they got shot, you know, presumably because, relying on the stereotype that black people the world over, even in rural Somerset, where there weren't any, um, you know, were groovy, uh, liked, uh, had a sense of rhythm and danced all the time. So this is the stereotype that the joke turned on. Now, I must confess, I thought it was funny when I was a kid and had uh, wasn't in school or ex uh, wasn't around any non-white people in uh, rural, which is very uh, countryfied. I grew up in a small village in Somerset, which is the most rural part of England. Um, did that make me a little racist? I don't know. I honestly don't know. According to Ronald D'Souza, uh, it would, because here goes the argument. He says, first, understanding a joke requires being aware of the propositions that it turns on. In other words, for me to, to understand that joke, I would have to have, have known that it was, it, it relied on the idea that black people like to dance. Um, if I didn't know that, I wouldn't get it at all. It would, I would just be confused. So that's number one. Number two is that you can understand a joke. You can get the joke without finding it funny. You can say, I get it. It's just not funny, right? So, so the first one says to get it at all, you need to understand the propositions. But understanding the propositions doesn't by itself make it funny. So there must be something else that makes it funny for you. The third uh, claim, which is also an observation, if you have a negative attitude to uh, the propositions, that will kill the joke for you. So in other words, I, if I heard the joke now, I hope I would say, from someone who said, oh, this is a really good joke, uh, I wouldn't laugh. Because I, in fact, I would say, that's not funny. And in saying that's not funny, I mean, that that's immoral. That's wrong. Um, so if I have this negative attitude to that, uh, to the, those claims, those stereotypes, I won't find it funny. I'll understand it because I will know the stereotypes exist, but I won't laugh. Okay. So, and number claim number four of the attitudinal endorsement theory by Ronald D'Souza is you can't just hypothetically endorse the uh, propositions. I can't, for the sake of the joke, pretend to believe that, you know, black people uh, always have to dance. Uh, either, there, in other words, there are only two possibilities. Either I endorse it, I say, yeah, that's so true, or I reject them. There's no in between. There's no sort of pretend endorsement. So consequently, what it is to find a joke funny is to understand it plus to endorse the attitudes. So find, so therefore, if you find a sexist or racist joke funny, that is because you endorse, you believe, you say those are true, the sexist or racist um, propositions or claims that they require for the joke to make sense. Uh, that's what D'Souza says. Now, obviously, Moriol and all three writers that we're reading disagree with that. 
Mario, we've already said, uh, gave the example of the Polish astronaut joke and says you can get that without actually believing Polish people are stupid. You can find it funny without even believing that people are stupid. Um, let me give you another example of a joke that I never found funny. And this one, this one is very offensive, so be prepared. And it's a sexist joke. And I actually overheard, uh, I, uh, in the summer holidays, two years when I was in college, I worked at this place that so was a bit like the British equivalent of Sam's Club. It was called uh, Booker Cash and Carry. And it only sold to like small corner shops or bodegas, you know. Uh, in other words, if you ran a corner shop or a tobacconist or whatever that sold stuff, you would go there to buy massive trays of it at a cut rate that you would then mark up and sell to make your profit. So it would sell giant trays of things or it would sell massive jars of mayonnaise to restaurants or uh, giant boxes of washing powder to laundromats and stuff like that. Uh, so I was working there and, and there was a guy who worked there who was, let's face it, an asshole. Um, and he told this joke to a woman who was working there and I was standing right there. You know, he told it in general, but she was there too. And here's the joke. And it, I, I would be amazed if anyone found it funny. Certainly she didn't. And he said, um, why do women have legs? And the, the answer is a question. Have you seen the mess a snail makes? Think about that for a second. Think about the implications of that. Um, what's the humor in there? I think that is clearly a joke that is immoral, that is wrong. Now, Mario would say that he has an explanation for that. Uh, now, what both Benatar and Smuts have got to do, both of them agree with, uh, sorry, disagree with, um, with the attitudinal endorsement theory, the idea that, you know, if you find a racist joke funny, you're uh, endorsing the argument. They've got to explain Okay, uh, first of all, why can you find the Polish joke funny without it being wrong? But why can you not find this joke funny without being a sexist jerk? What's the difference? D'Souza's got an answer. Well, D'Souza would say both of them are wrong. But if you're going to cut, if you're going to say some of them are okay and some of them aren't, you have to explain why. Now, first of all, what's wrong with D'Souza's position? Um, well, again, it's to do with necessary and sufficient, our old pals that we've already talked about. He says that endorsing the attitude is not sufficient to produce laughter. And he gives the example of unfunny Bush jokes. So presumably Smuts is saying, hey, we all hate George W. Bush. You know, this is written back in the Iraq war days. Um, that, that gives you some idea of the assumptions about his audience, the liberal philosopher audience. He said, OK, well, we all hate George W. Bush, but, but let's face it, there are some Bush jokes that aren't, that aren't funny. So we, we're we ready. We're ready to laugh at Bush. But then along comes this crap joke and merely endorsing the attitude, hey, Bush is stupid, isn't enough to carry the joke over into being funny. So in other words, endorsing the attitude doesn't isn't sufficient to produce humor. Uh, moreover, it's not necessary. Uh, now, how do you, he doesn't have an example that demonstrates that it's not necessary, but what he says is, D'Souza hasn't shown that you have to endorse the attitude uh, to be, um, for, uh, for you to find the joke funny. So, for example, in my lame, um, childhood joke, uh, D'Souza hasn't shown that you have to uh, endorse the, the belief that all black people dance. I don't think I even believed that back then. Um, but he, did, he says that you don't have to believe that to, um, to find it funny. And certainly the Polish example. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like most people, because you can actually, uh, and this is a point made later, 
Suppose you're told, yes, Noel Carroll makes this point in this Smuts article. Suppose you're told, hey, okay, Polish jokes for American people, they're Newfie jokes in Canada. So here's a Newfie joke. It's about a Newfie astronaut. A Newfie astronaut is going to the sun. You can, uh, you know, you can laugh at that, says Carol would say, without actually endorsing the attitude that Newfies are stupid, because you don't really know who Newfies are. You just know, here are these people that, for the point of this joke, you have to assume are stupid, and here's, uh, here's a funny way in which stupidity might manifest itself. So the real humor, uh, the uh, Smuts is suggesting, is in the construction of the joke. Is the joke funny? Is the joke clever? Uh, if the joke is clever, you will laugh at it without endorsing the attitudes it pre that you have to presuppose to get the joke. All right, so what he would appear to deny is that uh, either number four in of the attitudinal endorsement theory that you can't hypothetically endorse uh, propositions Carol seems to be giving an example where you can, you know, so pretend Newfies are stupid. Okay, here's the joke. Ha ha ha. Okay, do you really believe Newfies are stupid? I don't even know who they are. So you hypothetically endorsed it. Um, that seems to be a suggestion there. Or basically to show that there is another opportunity that you can, uh, there's another possibility between endorsing and, and not endorsing. Uh, the suggestion that Benatar meant, says, is just understanding. So Benatar suggests that understanding the, um, the propositions is enough. But I think D'Souza disagrees with that, clearly. All right. Now, um, one thing D'Souza could say in response is, okay, wait a minute. Um, look at racist jokes. Racist jokes don't even work unless they're racist. So, in other words, uh, substitute people. Uh, I'm going to use some um, Benatar's discussion of this. Uh, no, actually, I'll use Smuts. So, there's uh, Ted Cohen, who is a uh, theorist obviously writes on humor he's mentioned in this and I think he's mentioned in Benatar too tells a joke again it's not even remotely funny of how do you stop uh, a gang how do you stop black people committing a gang bang throw them a basketball so there the jo there there are two objectionable stereotypes that you know black people are sexual and driven to rape and two that you know all they they care about they care about basketball even more than that. Um, I, uh, I think it's a good sign that I don't even see that how that could be funny, but maybe there are people who laugh at that. So that joke doesn't work unless it's black people. You know, how do you stop white people committing a gangbang, throw them a basketball? Huh? There's not even a joke there. Um, so D'Souza would say the jokes clearly require endorsing the stereotype. And what um, the response of both Benatar and Smuts is, no, 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 no. What's going on there is it doesn't even make sense. You're not even understanding the joke if there's white people because there's no, uh, there's no stereotype of, that fits there. But if you substitute a stereotype for white people, you can create a directly analogous joke that does work. And that isn't so. In other words, jokes don't have to be racist against minority groups to work, which is what uh, um, De Souza seems to be suggesting. Uh, and uh, the suggestion that Smuts made for for a stereotype about white people he says, "How do you stop frat kids committing a gangbang? Tell them the keg's ready." So there, you know, the target is rich white kids. And it still works because we have this stereotype about them. So it's not inherently racist. It doesn't rely on racism um, for the joke to work. Um, and uh, Smuts also mentions the Seinfeld uh, joke about the an you're an anti-dentite. I believe that was the episode 
where the writers thought that the anti-dentite was the the part of the episode that would really get that re people would really fixate on but i think that's the yada yada episode and everybody just remembers that it, elaine says yada 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 to cover up parts of a story and that really took off and everybody forgot about the anti-dentite one that's um brian cranston as the dentist uh, he is plays a recurring role in uh, as a dentist in seinfeld and he's hilarious uh, of course he went on to be do breaking bad anyway uh the anti-dentite joke um jerry tells a joke about dentists and uh kramer finds it says oh no i'm sorry that's not funny that's anti-dentite you know the joke being that it's sort of self-referential that uh Kramer is like Ronald D'Souza and he's treating dentists as if they were a minority group that you can't tell jokes about. Um, okay, so instead of that theory, the, th uh, the theory that D'Souza suggests, which is the uh, attitudinal endorsement theory, in other words, what explains whether or not a joke is racist, there is the merited response theory um, now, this is a normative theory of humor. That is, it says what it is to be, even to be funny, has a built-in moral component. And again, both Smuts and Benatar are going to deny this. Smuts and Benatar are going to say, funny is funny, moral is moral, they're independent. You can find something funny and then later on say, ooh, I shouldn't have laughed at that. Was it funny? Yes, it was funny, but I'm bad to laugh at it. That's okay. You can say that according to Smuts and Benatar. You can say that something is funny and you're bad for laughing at it. So you can make a moral judgment. That's fine. Uh, certain kinds of jokes you shouldn't laugh at. But are they funny? Yes. So you can have bad jokes that are still funny according to Smuts and Benatar. But according to the merited response theory, if a joke is bad, that means it's not funny. And the idea behind this is this is when we say that's not funny. Clearly, there's a moral judgment in there. What we're saying is that is immoral and therefore it's not funny. So Beris Gout takes that idea and says that works for all humor. If it is immoral, then it is not funny. It is not even humorous. Um, okay, so judgments, according to Beres Kaut's merited response theory, uh, judgments of humor are normative, so being funny requires not being morally objectionable. And according to Beres Kaut, the funny is not the same thing as being the object of laughter. So in other words, suppose somebody laughed at uh, a horrible racist or sexist joke. Was it funny? No. They just laughed at it, but it wasn't funny. Um, yeah, that, that sounds kind of reasonable. That's his idea. Uh, so it's being, so the funny is not the same as either the object of laughter or that which people find funny. So what is funny? It's not simply, uh, if you say, if someone wanted to find out, I want to find out what's funny. And they went out and just recorded everything people laughed at. They would be making a mistake according to the merited response theory, because people can laugh at something and it not be funny. Okay, so what? It, how does humor work? Well, according to Smuts, gout seems to have a two-stage process. First, you find something funny, and then you ask, does it merit that response of finding it funny? And only if the answer to part, the second part is yes, is it actually funny? So merely laughing isn't enough. It's necessary, but not sufficient, presumably. Uh, first, you've got to laugh at something, but... Not everything you laugh at is funny, according to this view. Now, Smut says, well, all right, I get what you're saying with the that's not funny implies that there's a moral component, but notice that the reverse doesn't work. We don't say that is funny means that that something is morally good. So we don't say, you know, look at wholesome jokes and say, now that is funny. Um, Maybe some people do, but it certainly doesn't work in the same way. It is certainly true that people will say that's not funny, meaning you shouldn't laugh at that. So there's obviously a should, a normative, a moral element to that. But he says we shouldn't take that one thing that we do 
and apply it to all of humor and say that therefore all of humor has a moral component because notice we that's just a weird thing that we happen to do that d doesn't even have a counterpart when we say that is funny so that's uh, that's Smuts's first response to this theory um, he says you can laugh at a starving child because you saw a starving child by the side of the road who looked so bad that you thought they were an old man and then you recognize that they're in fact a starving child and you realize that you've made a mistake and you laugh now that's clearly going from the incongruity theory and he says then it is funny to you even though according to the merited response theory that it's appalling you shouldn't laugh at a starving child so therefore it's not funny what what uh, Smuts would say is no what we should say is that was funny and then you should feel bad for finding it's funny uh, but it was funny to you now so he suggests subjectivism in humor that is humor is what we find funny so in other words things can be funny for me but not funny for you so there is no such thing as the funny gout seems to suggest an objective view that there is like Plato's idea of the forms there is this thing and it's funny and some people recognize it and they're right other people look at other things and say they're funny and they're wrong kind of like our view of great art you know uh, now people disagree a bit over this but certainly art students would say if you think a crying clown painted on black velvet is funny it is great art you're just wrong you know because you haven't had an art education uh, and the same thing you might say gout, gout would say if you laugh at racist jokes you're wrong because you don't know better because you're you're a bad person um okay uh now skip ahead to um Smut says affects mitigated emotional responsibility view and he says uh, okay laughter it is certainly true that insults and stereotype jokes can harm but what does this say about our sense of humor in other words suppose gout is right and we shouldn't have laughed at something um, what does he say if on page 343 smuts us if we find something funny that we should not what kind of trouble are we in what kind of if you say we shouldn't have done it what's the response it's like Kant tells us what should happen if we lie when we shouldn't you know something there's a there's a response that should happen to us okay if we, I find something funny that I shouldn't have what should happen to me should I be locked in humor jail and he says the reason why it seems wrong to say that I'm wrong to find it funny is because I'm not really responsible for my sense of humor I can't help it we think that you should only be punished or you're only wrong when you had control like if I have Tourette syndrome and and some people who have Tourette syndrome blurt out swear words for some reason so I'm walking along I yell out fuck at the top of my lungs in the middle of a you know a, right next to a school playground if I have Tourette syndrome I haven't done anything wrong because I couldn't help it it's just something that happens to you whereas if I could if I don't have Tourette's and I'm doing it just because I hate kids and I want to teach them a bad word then I'm wrong so think of your sense of humor are you responsible for what you find funny and he says well to a certain extent you can control what you a, a limited extent you can control what you find funny and certainly you can stifle laughter if you watch uh, life of Brian there's a great scene in life of Brian where um, uh, Michael Palin playing a Roman centurion or something is talking about his friend Biggest Dickus, a very good friend friend in Rome called Biggest Dickus, uh, and the Roman soldier is trying not to laugh at this name. And uh, Michael Palin is looking at him very carefully as he walks, talking about Biggest Dickus. Um, there's someone stifling their laughter. Now, to the extent that you can suppose you know that laughing at someone, like you know, if your kid is trying to do something trying to show off to you and they fall smack on their face and you know they're not hurt but their pride is hurt you can stop yourself laughing at their pratfall you know presumably if you're a good parent unlike me you won't even be tempted to laugh but suppose you're tempted to laugh because it was pretty funny and you know they're not hurt 
um, you can still stifle the laughter because you know that you laughing at them will will harm them in psychologically. So to that extent, if you can control it and you don't, then you are wrong. You have done something wrong. So that's the effects mitigated emotional responsibility theory. You're responsible for voluntary laughter, but not laughter that you couldn't have controlled. Eh, that's a pretty mealy-mouthed position, but it sounds plausible. All right, finally, Benatar, because... Nobody's watching, but I, I, I made my notes, so I'm going to finish them. Um, he gives this chart of the four types of criticism of, um, of humor. Four types of criticism of humor. There's the non-contextual that he handles first. Uh, there's non-contextual agent-based, and there's non-contextual humor-based criticisms, and he says the non-contextual are too general to be plausible. So he quickly dismisses them. The ones that he spends some time on are the contextual, uh, either agent-based or humor-based, and he says they merit serious response. But quickly, the non-contextual agent-based, something like that is D'Souza's attitudinal endorsement theory. That is, it's agent-based because we criticize the person who finds it funny. If you are laughing, you are a bad person. And um, you are a bad person because you, you agree with this general claim, the sexist or racist claim. Now, the example of a joke that trades on stereotypes, but you can find it funny without endorsing them, uh, D'Souza would deny that such a thing exists, but here, uh, but we've already seen the Polish astronaut example. And how about this one on page 29 in uh, Benatar? A Jew, a Scot, and an Englishman have dinner together at a restaurant. After the meal, the waiter approaches them and asks to whom he should present the bill. The Scot says, I'll pay. The headline in the newspaper the next morning reads, Jewish ventriloquist found dead in alley. Okay, the joke is, a Scot would never offer to pay because Scots are notoriously tight-fisted. Uh, Jews are sneaky. So what this Jewish ventriloquist did, uh, Jews are also have a stereotype of being mean and tight-fisted, so, but they're also sneaky. That's, so they have two uh, bad stereotypes. And what the Jewish guy did was he, managed, he threw his voice so it looked like the Scot was agreeing. But the Scot being violent, oh yes, they have two stereotypes. So Scots are tight-fisted and violent. Jews are tight-fisted and uh, sneaky. And all of these stereotypes are required to get the joke. But what Benatar is saying, you can get the joke without endorsing it. So he says um, that... Uh, yeah, so basically you can get it without endorsing it. And in fact, you know, suppose uh, what D'Souza would say is, oh, yeah, you would say that. You like to think of yourself as not racist, but actually you do endorse it. So you are racist. Prove me wrong. And uh, D'Souza could say, I happen to know. Uh, uh, well, so prove me wrong, says D'Souza. And then uh, Benatar says, I introspect. I look inside myself and say, do I believe these stereotypes? And I say, no. And then to this, D'Souza can say, ah, yes, but implicit bias studies, uh, and you're probably familiar with these, these are uh, things like you can do these, if you Google implicit, via, uh, implicit bias studies, and you will be able to perform little tests that will tell you how racist and sexist you are. Um, because what they do is they measure reaction times and ask you different questions and people are much quicker to say that a white person is good than a black person and much quicker to say a black person is responsible for something bad than a white person. So your your reaction times are giving you away. And these are implicit biases and someone who says I am not racist or sexist still does badly on these tests. So what D'Souza can say is you claim not to endorse these theories but implicit biases prove that you you do. Um, well, what Benatar says in response to that, he says, okay, but even if implicit bias 
tests do demonstrate that we're racist or sexist, D'Souza ha still has to prove that it is the sexism and the racism that contributes to the joke. And he hasn't shown the mechanism. He's just assumed that there is one. Because clearly, you can find jokes funny without um, racism and you you can be racist but not find a racist joke funny because it's just stupid or I can you know hate George W Bush but not find a Bush joke funny um, then he gives the old man in the coffin joke laughter isn't necessarily trivializing so you can laugh at a, a stereotype but not in a way that is damaging to the people that it stereotypes um, now, he suggests that maybe even rape, rape jokes would be okay. There was a big uh, controversy. Was it Tosh? I've forgotten his first name. Daniel Tosh, who told a rape joke like a couple of years ago and everybody piled on him for it. And he says it wasn't bad because... So he was taking the position that these guys are, that you, certainly Benatar seems to, that you can tell a rape joke without finding rape funny. It's just the mechanism of the joke. That is, um, and I'll give you an example, actually. Um, this is very much like the rape joke that they, they tell uh, in, in the Smuts article um, that D'Souza says is wrong. Uh, there was a show on British TV that was actually showed on American TV, too, by this Irish comedian called Dave Allen. Um, my wife saw it on when in this it was like in the 70s so uh he, he was very famous in britain in fact he got into trouble he was he was one of the first people to say fuck on the bbc um once and then it sort of the floodgates opened after that but uh he was an irish comic and he would part of it would be him sitting on a stool drinking a, a drink and telling us telling jokes and then he would also do little sketches and i remember one sketch was the, he was dressed up as a Viking and he was obviously invading as the Vikings do he was invading Britain and he was saying rape and plunder rape and plunder and then this hideous old woman came up and said yes please and the horns in his helmet turned down and he just he went on saying plunder plunder so clearly the joke is she wanted to be raped and then he didn't want to rape her because she was too ugly to be raped this was a joke on Saturday Night TV, where I, as a child, saw it and laughed at it. Um, what's going on there? Uh, can Benatar and Smuts defend that joke? Uh, now, I think what they would say is that some people can laugh at that without being bad, and some people can laugh at that with being bad, because you can find a joke funny while endorsing it, and find a joke funny while just understanding what is required for the joke to make sense. Whereas what D'Souza would say is, if you find it funny, you endorse the attitude, and if it's a bad attitude, you're a bad person. Um, all right, so that was non-contextual agent-based. Then there's non-contextual humor-based criticism. That would just be a type of humor, any a specific type of humor because of the type can't be funny. He suggests blasphemous humor, as was said at the time of the Danish cartoons about the Prophet Muhammad. And he said that he doesn't find that plausible because, for one thing, nobody can give a consistent definition of what counts as blasphemy. People say, if I find it funny, it's not blasphemous. Like some people uh, accused the Pythons of that Life of Brian was blasphemous. In fact, he got banned in Ireland because Life of Brian was considered blasphemous. Whereas they vehemently argue, and I put a link to their um, interview where they argue this, that it is not at all blasphemous. It doesn't make, fun of, doesn't make fun of Christianity. It just makes fun of some people who uh, have stupid reasons for following people. Um, so that illustrates that defining blasphemy is notoriously hard. So he says that's a non-starter, just to say that certain types of laughter, uh, certain types of humor are verboten, cannot be laughed at, doesn't work. 
So he says better criticisms of humor are contextual. That is, that they're saying there's something specific about the circumstances referenced in this joke that make it bad. And there's contextual agent based, and he gives the example where, and this is a common claim, certain people can tell this joke, but other people can't. Like gay people can tell jokes where they use the term fag, or black people can use, you know, the N word, uh, but white people can't. Richard Pryor used the N word all the time in his early stuff before he uh, blew up his face, uh, freebasing. Um, his early stand up, he uses that all the time. And in fact, it was during that period that he co wrote um, Blazing Saddles, which has the N word in it many times. Of course, it's uttered by racist white people who are the butt of jokes. So Benatar would probably defend every instance of that. But certainly we do argue that um, certain people can tell jokes and certain people can't. Um, that would be contextual agent based. That is, it is something about the teller of the joke that makes um, the joke either okay or forbidden. And then there's contextual humor based, which says uh, that a specific type of humor causes harm, like uh, in certain circumstances, you shouldn't tell an anti Muhammad joke or something like that. Um, uh, you can also, you can tell insulting jokes, humor that involves insulting people, you can tell t uh, in circumstances where you're among friends or something, but um, in other circumstances, not because people will get too offended. All right. Then he says, so these kind of criticisms, they're better criticisms. He doesn't say they're right. He says they're better. But then he goes on to a section called mistakes in humor ethics, where he says, okay, here's reasons that would, here's reasons why uh, your, uh, even a contextual based criticism might go wrong. So first mistake is that uh, most criticisms ignore the benefits of humor. The first benefit of humor is that it gives you pleasure. It's funny. It makes you laugh. And that's a benefit that is not nothing. It's important. So what he would say is if a joke is funny enough, it might be okay that it is immoral. Uh, and I think that's true. People say, oh, that's bad. That's bad. Uh, but they laugh. Uh, and they say what they mean is that you're lucky that joke is so funny. Otherwise, you wouldn't get away with that. Um, other benefits are that humor is a great uh, deflator of the powerful. Um, so he gives the example of the Mugabe and uh, anti-Mugabe and anti-Nazi jokes, uh, which are good. And both of them are dangerous jokes because they're directed against the powerful who could, who could and did kill and lock up their critics. Um, Mugabe, thankfully, has been pushed out of power in Zimbabwe, but he's still around and the replacement isn't looking like that much better. But he was, he was a terrible um, despot for many, many years. So, uh, but the point of humor, and, and look at it, you can tell that rulers, you can tell from their displeasure that rulers are recognizing that humor is a valuable tool against them look at Trump's current criticism of uh, people like Stephen Colbert and Jimmy Kimmel. He's come to, you know, he says they're not funny, they, should, they shouldn't be allowed because of course they are funny and they're laughing at him and he recognizes that that is bad for him. Um, it softens criticism, uh, humor suffers criticism, you can deliver a criticism but if you make a little joke out of it then you can deliver the criticism so that they get the criticism, but they're not offended and they don't, you know, brush it off. Uh, punctures pretentiousness. Pretentiousness is bad. It's good to puncture it. Helps you cope with anxieties. Again, the old man in the coffin joke and, of course, the uh, deathbed humor. And he points out, this is true. Uh, this is a weird thing about humor. Whenever something bad happens, jokes pop up like mushrooms all over the country. Like, I, like in the Ethiopian famine when I was a kid, 
jokes about Ethiopians popped up, which seemed like they were bad in the way that Mario said that that National Lampoon cover was bad, but they certainly cropped up, and and the same jokes appearing like almost simultaneously all over the country. And after the shuttle uh, accidents, both of them uh, jokes appeared in schoolyards all over the country. And he suggests that's a way for us to deal with the tragedy. You know, otherwise it's too awful, so we have to make fun of it, but not in a way that's disrespectful. It's just otherwise we can't deal with it. And there's a, there's jokes, there's ample evidence that the Jews in the concentration camps told humor, very dark humor, but they made jokes. Um, it now actually there so. This brings up the one of the documentaries, The Last Laugh, which is about uh, jokes about the Holocaust. Um, so that's relevant to that. And it also you battle oppressions as when the stereotype when the stereotype itself that the joke relies on is used as a butt, like uh, the jokes about um, the Christian Christian versus Jewish and the black versus white versions of a joke where two Jews walking down the street, one says, goes in to convert to Christianity for a hundred, uh, and they agree that they get paid and they'll split the money. So one goes in, comes out, and the, the one who didn't convert says, where's my $50? And the new Christian replies, is that all you people think about? Uh, implying that, now here the joke is that all Christians have stereotypes about Jews. So the stereotype about the Jew is itself being critiqued. Um, reminds me of actually of the dentist in Seinfeld again. He converts to to Judaism and is immediately telling Jewish jokes. And Jerry is a bit put out because he says, you're not allowed to do that yet. That's a little quick. Um, so that's the first mistake is benefits ignored. And he's listed the benefits. Second mistake is the contextual considerations are oversimplified. So uh, if we say the teller of the joke, you have to be a black person to tell jokes that rely on stereotypes about black people. Uh, and c certainly a lot of black comedians do that. They tell jokes that rely on stereotypes about black people. Um, now, if you say, if the criticism says, oh, you're a white person, therefore you cannot tell your joke. He says that's oversimplified. It may be true for some white people, they can't tell that. Um, but the claim that only an insider can tell a joke uh, is wrong because sometimes even the insider shouldn't. Sometimes group insiders can share negative attitude. Uh, remember Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor made a conscious decision to stop making the N-word because he decided that's wrong even if black people say it because it actually facilitates uh, negative self-images. So he would agree with that. Um, knowing uh, the second point that Benatar makes is that knowing that even group insiders can internalize stereotypes that are against them, um, you shouldn't laugh at a black pe person telling a black themed joke because you might say, ah, that even they can't tell that. Um, Dave Chappelle, now actually this might be relevant to the audience, so I'll get to that in a second. Uh, the third point is sometimes with an outsider you can tell she doesn't endorse the stereotype. Sarah Silverman did this a lot. Sarah Silverman used to tell jokes where her persona was a kind of ditzy white person and she would tell clearly racist jokes. That was a lot of her early humor. But the joke being it was clearly meta. She was saying this is a persona of a white person. I am mocking this. Uh, so my telling a racist joke is actually a meta joke about the kind of person who would tell this racist joke. Now Benatar is saying you could do that, but it's certainly dicey and it's certainly risky. And I don't. And actually, Sarah Silverman doesn't do that anymore. And it decided that yeah, she kind of regrets that. <clears throat> the um, the second kind of context that can be so there's three contexts that can be oversimplified: the teller, the audience and the butt of the joke. So we've seen the teller, now the audience. Uh, the usual, the sort of blanket claim is that a joke shouldn't be told to outsiders. Uh, in fact, yes, Dave Chappelle 
famously quit The Chappelle Show, which was this incredibly successful show uh, that everybody loved and thought was hilarious. It, this was, you know, white people in particular loved this show. Um, and he quit it and just went off and went off to South Africa for a while and disappeared from our view. And people say, why did he go crazy? Why did he stop? And his explanation was that he didn't like who was laughing at the jokes and the way they were laughing at Because a lot of those jokes were like he had a character who was a, uh, a street person who was addicted to drugs. And he saw white people laughing at that. And he didn't like the way they were laughing. It was like, you're getting out of this joke. Ha ha, aren't black people stupid? And aren't they prone to getting addicted to drugs? And that's funny. And he said, I don't like that. That wasn't what I was going for. I'm telling recognition humor because I know people who've become addicts. And this is actually my joke is, you know, this person is contemptible, so don't be like this person. Whereas other people are getting from that, oh, black people are like that. And he suddenly thought, oh, ah, I don't like this. They, I can't tell it to this audience. But what Benatar says in response is, um, it's possible that others can enjoy the humor without developing negative humor. It's certainly true that self-deprecating humor is safer. But having even said that, if you've seen, there's a, a now famous show on Netflix by a comedian, uh, an Aus Australian comedian called Hannah Gadsby. Called, and the show is called Nanette, if you want to watch it on Netflix. And it starts funny and then she sort of deconstructs the funny and it becomes kind of a stern lecture on humor. In a, and people say this is amazing. Uh, you know, you certainly should see it. And she criticizes her form. She's, she's a lesbian and she told jokes that whether you would only laugh at them if, if you understood stereotypes about lesbians. And she said she used to think it was okay because it was self-deprecating humor. And then she decided, no, that self-deprecation is bad and damaging and I've got to stop doing that. So Benatar thinks self-deprecating is okay and she would presumably criticize that. Boy, this is dragging on. All right, uh, third context that can be oversimplified is the butt of the joke can affect whether or not it should be funny. Uh, so the suggestion is if you make a joke about a man or, or a white person, that's okay. But if you make a joke about a woman or a black person or a genuinely a marginalized group, that's not okay. That's the claim and what uh, that's the claim that critics of humor make. And what Benatar says that oversimplifies things. He said, no, he says that may be true in a lot of cases, but don't, you know, it, it, don't always assume that it's going to be right. And he says, for example, a joke about a male nurse might be more damaging than joke about a female doctor. You know, so there's a joke about a man that might be worse than a joke about a woman. That's kind of, he doesn't say much about that. All right, the third type of mistake that uh, critics of humor can make is that offense is given too much weight. So in other words, if you say that a joke is wrong because people are offended, that's not enough. You can't just say that. He says, if you say that, then look what you're doing. Here are the bad, uh, the bad uh, implications of doing that. First of all, someone who takes offense at everything is suddenly has a veto over all humor. So he says this gives a moral veto to the hypersensitive, and that's just wrong. Those people are jerks. Number two, there's no difference between, according to this, there's no difference between warranted outrage and unwarranted outrage. Um, there are certainly cases where people are outraged at a joke for a bad reason. And he says, if that is the case, then it's not the outrage itself that is wrong, it's the reason. So we shouldn't say oh, a joke is wrong because you're outraged at it. We could say, should say, if a joke is wrong, it's because there's a good reason to be outraged about it. But it's the reason, not the outrage, that we should be focusing on. Uh, it assumes a moral right not to be offended. You don't have a moral right to be offended, particularly if you're a rich, powerful person. Look at Trump. He's always saying it's outrageous that they say this about a president. Is he really outraged? Probably not. He just wants his followers to be. But uh, sorry, if you're in a position of power, you don't have a right not to be outraged. Um, also, 
the, what's offensive to one group may be beneficial to another. What white, pe white people are saying, oh, hey, you know, we're now the butt of all jokes. That's not fair. But uh, what marginalized communities could say is that it's about time and this is evening the, the, the playing field. So there's a beneficial effect of this that it's making society more even. So you've got to weigh the outrage against the benefit. Uh, his last one was that it's even contradictory because I might find offensive the fact that you find everything offensive. It offends me that you cry wolf at every little thing. I find that offensive. So you're, uh, if we're saying let's minimize offense, then it's kind of works against each other. But I'm not sure if that's his strongest point. He does concede that you shouldn't gratuitously tell uh, crude jokes to prudes. If your point is just to outrage, you're a, you're a bad, that's not funny. Outrage, outrage for the sake of outrage is kind of pointless. Uh, so his guidelines for judging jokes ask, does the humor, um, does the humor express a defect in the teller of the audience? Balance the effects, the harms against the benefits. Make sure that the location is appropriate. Bar yes, church no. Make sure the timing is appropriate. You know, there's such a thing as too soon. And if it's offensive, make sure that the offense, uh, like, if somebody is offended, then we should check and see if they are they are warranted in being offended. If they're not warranted, if they just say, I'm offended about that, then screw them. But if they're warranted, then, you know, that's a, a good, um, a good reason to criticize them. All right. That's enough of that. Uh, to the zero people who made it to the end of the video, good for you. Thanks for watching.